Got it. Amazing. Look at everyone coming in. <laughs> Fantastic. No mai haere mai e te whanau, kua hui hui mai nei tiki tene hui. Ko Catherine McAlpine, aho. Ko aho te hea man ao, te wahi wahini o Tamaki Makoto. We'll open with a karakia. E te whanau, whaia kia marama, kia whaitaki i roto i o mahi katoa. Kia tu, kia kaha, kia hora te marino, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato kia tato katoa. Ameni. It's my pleasure to welcome you all tonight. A special welcome to Karanina Sumio, a remarkable and tireless advocate for social justice. In recent years, Karanina has been focusing on the ethnic and gender pay gaps and why Aotearoa New Zealand needs pay transparency. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about that tonight. We are honoured to have her here with us. Welcome, Karanina. Unfortunately, Marnie Dunlop is not able to be with us. And um, I'm really thrilled to say that the Auckland Women's Centre researcher, amongst many other things, the wonderful fabulous Janet McAllister has stepped into the role at the very last minute for us. So thanks so much, Janet. And finally, a big welcome to all of you who have taken your time out of your busy lives to join in this kōrero. This is our fifth and last Wahine Toa Forum this year, designed to provide an opportunity for us all to hear from Wahine thought leaders. I'll hand over to you now, Janet. Kia ora, uh, ngā mihi nui kia koe, Catherine, uh, many thanks for the welcome and the karakia, so kia ora. Um, tēnei te mihi ki ngā mana whenua o Tāmaki Makoro o Aotearoa, tēnā koutou. As Pākehā, as tau iwi sitting in this great city of ours, I acknowledge mana whenua of Tāmaki and of the country, as um, some of you may be zooming in from other places, so if you are, welcome. Um, more specifically, I am at my home um, near our city's greatest volcano, Maungafo, um, and the rest of my family is out at pub quiz tonight, so we shouldn't have any interruptions. Um, okay, a bit of housekeeping. Um, you, the audience, are muted, as Catherine said, and you'll have your videos off, so you can relax and breathe a sigh of relief, and the rest of us can work out if we've got um, lipstick on our teeth or not. Um, feel free to use the chat function to ask questions um, and we will get to those um, a little bit later um, tonight. Um, and many thanks to our New Zealand Sign Language interpreters, Stephanie Afeto and Taran Banks, thank you. Um, it is a great pity Mani could not be with us tonight, um, but I do confess that on a personal note, I am excited to be meeting one of my heroes. Um, so, Sanoa Mali'i Karanina Sumeo. Um, you're doing a great job of shining a light on widespread practices of human rights abuses in New Zealand that most of us have preferred to brush away and not look at um, in shame or just put into the too hard basket. So kia ora, Karanina, thank you for your work and thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. Uh, good Janet and uh, Koto. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's an absolute honour to be here um, to... Uh, to add, well, to add human rights to his voice, you know, to the cause of poor women. It's, um, I mean, you're the tireless champions who've been doing this work for so long. Um, and I do feel that we are moving forward, perhaps not as fast as we would like, but um, I am optimistic uh, for women in our country. So, and thanks, thanks to champions like the Women's um, Centre in Berlin and our other sisters around the country for the tireless work. Thank you very much for having me on. Uh, kia, kia ora, Karanina, and it's nice to hear that that hopeful note, um, which we all need and um, and which we can um, yeah, explore a bit more. So by way of introduction, um, Dr. Sumeo Karanina is originally from the village of Vailima, Upolo and Samoa. 
she has three children, one of whom helped to turn her uh, camera on tonight. So, so kia ora. Um, and she has worked as a chemist, a social worker, and a policy advisor. And she has a PhD in child abuse prevention. So if that um, wide eclectic CV wasn't impressive, impressive enough, um, what we are actually talking about tonight is her remarkable work as the Equal Employment Opportunities Commissioner at the Human Rights Commission over the last four years. Karanina initiated the landmark Pacific Pay Gap Inquiry, and we will and talk about its very important recommendations shortly. Um, and I also hope we'll find time to discuss the link between the pay gap work and Karanina's other high profile work this year, um, i.e. The, the seasonal migrant worker exploitation and, and what's happening in that space. Um, but first, Karanina, um, for those of us not privileged enough to have been brought up for our Samoa, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Samoan concepts and approaches regarding respect for women and for gender that you grew up with and um, maybe how that informs the work that you do currently. Mm, well, no, thank you. Um, I mean, I, I grew up in what would be considered a traditional island setting. Um, I grew up around cousins and aunts and uncles uh, in Samoa, and I'm, I'm talking about that because it, it did set the foundation for who I am. Um, we owned our own land, um, and that is something that's very, very special, very important. Um, so when I came here and I came to understand in terms of and their, their loss of land, I immediately understood um the spiritual loss the loss of um means for self-empowerment and self-determination um is, is is tied to land so i grew up i didn't know hunger until i came to new zealand um i didn't feel poor until i came to new zealand um so in samoa we didn't have material material wealth but the, the wealth of land, the wealth of love, the sense of place. Um, you knew who you were. You knew what was right and wrong. You knew your responsibilities to each other. Um, that was really important in setting the, the foundation for me as, as, as a person. Um, and certainly in terms of uh, respect, um, because it was a collective. So, you know, to, it wasn't always um, what was you didn't always pursue what you wanted to pursue if it had an impact on someone else. And, but also you could expect others to take responsibility for you in return for your part. So it was just like a, that's just how the, the collective, the collective worked. Um, so coming to New Zealand was, um, was quite an experience for me. Um, you know, I, I came to this place where I didn't know the language and we lived in a, a property where it was all fenced. And that was completely new to me. This whole thing of a fence was new. And um, I wasn't allowed, to, my grandparents said, you don't, go over, don't go over the fence. You can't just go over the fence and play with other kids, you know. So, um, so that whole thing of suddenly coming from this to this psychologically was quite an adjustment for me. And so I had to learn new rules in terms of new rules of engagement. Um, and, um, but I still had that sense, um, I still understood that sense of uh, reciprocity and accountability for my actions. And uh, the sense of whatever, whatever I did would have an impact on my family. And so education was really important. I had to succeed. You know, it was a time when we all, most of us came from school, we didn't have laptops, doesn't matter. The expectation was I would succeed come what may. So that was really important to me. And, Thankfully, I grew up in a family of teachers. Uh, my mom was a teacher, she was also a journalist. Um, you know, family of teachers and preachers. So I suppose I was really fortunate to have people who understood the value of education in terms of empowerment. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about my, my background. Um, I certainly miss my, my home. As, as I just said before our meeting, I'm going home in January to visit the graves of my parents and my elders. Um, and most of my family still live in Samoa. So I'm very much an island girl at heart. Put it that way. And I'm quite impressed with your pronunciation, damn it. Oh. <laughs> I'm going name the time with you. Oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, 
Oh, thank you, thank you, um, Karanina. Um, so you came when, here when you were 10. When you say you didn't know hunger in Samoa, what do you mean by you knew it here? Was it you saw it or did you experience it yourself? I experienced it. Um, so uh, like it, it wasn't it wasn't uncommon that we'll just have one loaf of bread between myself and my sister and my cousins. Um, and that was that was it. If the bread ran out, that was it. So I because I was the eldest cousin, put it that way. So not only was I responsible for making the, the breakfast, you know, for us, but also for making the lunches. And sometimes it may just be a sandwich for the whole day at school. Um, and um, I had neighborhood fruit trees and I discovered this tree called a peach. Um, I didn't know it was called a peach. I, I just saw this fruit. And so as you do in the eyes, you just go and help yourself to the neighbor's fruit. <laughs> Until I was told, of, no, you, you, can't, you can't help yourself. But because I was hungry, and um, yeah, it was yeah, it was a, a new thing. As I grew up, you know, if one family didn't have enough. You just you would go just go buy to something with the neighbors, or you know, it's like the village raised a child. Literally, um, that didn't happen here. It was it's a different type of village, but it wasn't that sort of village. So yeah, I I I knew hunger for the first time. Um, one of the things I I noticed um, is um, loneliness. I felt lonely for the first time um, because you didn't have that whole unit. So it was quite an, an adjustment. Um, but I later, as I grew up, understood this thing called privacy and private property <laughs> and, um, and what that means. So lots of adjustments. So, and I suppose as an adult, I'm still navigating some of those spaces in terms of you know, how do we how do we make lives better for everyone, including Pacific people? Um, what does fairness mean? Um, you know, privacy versus collective um, collective responsibility and privacy versus transparency. You know, so we're always still navigating those spaces towards you know, so we can have a fair society and better quality of life for everyone. This might be jumping ahead, but you know, those are big big discussion points. Um, are there any particular principles that you've kind of come to through that navigation or is it a case by case basis or how would you describe it? Um, well, I, I think for me, duty and responsibility in terms of service and service of others is, is quite ingrained in me. Um, so quite a lot of my, um, my professional career has been in the public service and that's no accident. Because I, you know, I, I do believe in this thing of uh, ensuring that all that that everybody is lifted. Um, mm. We have a responsibility there, and that comes from being part of a collective. Um, that you have a, a duty and a responsibility for the for the for the good of all. Um, so that's I was, really yeah, I was I was thinking that I was thinking do, so so this very strong sense of um, what could be termed social justice. For you, it's that responsibility, that duty, and do you? And as you say, it comes out of having that collective um, uh, childhood. Do you think it's that matched with the um, the poverty you saw and experienced in in New Zealand, and also seeing how other, you know, um, I'm just thinking, is it is it both those things, or how how would you describe it? Um, I mean, co collective social justice is. You know, as, again, to talk to Janet, I think, um, you, you know, that, that means a lot. And, and I think when I think about Aotearoa, we're really a small village. It's like an expanded version of where I grew up, <laughs> you know, compared to the, to the rest of the, of the developed world. We're a tiny village and um, the degrees of separation, you know, is, 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 is very short. So I think we just have this in instinct as, as Kiwis to look after each other, to be curious about our neighbors. Um, you know, with, with in boundaries, of course. And then we know what fairness feels like, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and when, when, we, when we see unfairness, it, it does touch a nerve in us and we want, we want to, to stop that unfairness. Um, and of course, there are people uh, in positions uh, where you, you, have the, you have the resources to act on that, that drive to make things fairer. Whereas for others, they're just trying to survive, as we know. Um, so, you know, I think this idea of fairness and social justice and uh, being in service of others 
is is quite fundamental uh, to the way that I see the world and what drives me as a commissioner. Mm, mm, kia ora. So if we um if we go from the general to I think probably an example of this, which is the pay equity. Um, I would expect most of our audience to, to know about the Pacific Pay Gap. Um, that's why they're there. Um, and obviously you've got that amazing um, website that I hope we put into the meeting chat um, about, about I, I love your infographics, which show Pakia, Māori, Pacific, and, and both um, men and women. Um, and of course, one of the things that I think it's really highlighted that um, hasn't necessarily been in the discourse, um, at least the mainstream kind of Pākehā discourse in the same way before, is that Māori men and Pacific men also learn less on average than Pākehā women. So it really is that ethnicity and, and gender pay gap there. Um, I wanted, I know that you yourself experienced um, discrimination in, in pay, and I wondered if you could um, just tell us a bit about that and also how the inquiry came about. Was it, was it your idea? Would it have happened if you were not commissioner, do you think? Hmm. Um, it, it might have. I mean, what, what triggered the inquiry for me wasn't, wasn't what happened to me. It was um, when I when I came into the commission and within weeks of landing here, I, I saw the report, the, the annual uh, State Services Commission report, it was called the now the Public Service. And uh, they had their pay gaps here. That was the first time I'd heard this term ethnic pay gap because it was actually in the report. Um, and I thought, wow, you know, this, this and, and it's clearly, it's, it's, it's been something that's, that's been measured for some time and clearly Pacific were consistently at the bottom. And that's when I it triggered my memory about my experience um, of having discovered that I um, was paying significantly less than others who are doing very similar work. Um, and so if I can talk a little bit about my, my experience, uh, I was doing some, some work at a, at a particular organization I was at. Um, I was looking at pay scales, collective agreements, that sort of thing. And I noticed that in this particular collective agreement, there was a role there. Um, there was a role that wasn't in there. And so I asked where that role was and I was told, oh, it's, it's on a management scale. And I went, oh, but why isn't my role then on a management scale? Because it's technically, you know, it's, it's very similar. And, um, and so that's how it started. I was just asking the innocent question. And I was fortunate that there was a manager who was receptive to the question, because <laughs> that, 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 that's not always the case, as we heard from the Pacific Inquiry, where people ask why they're not paid really, and they don't get a helpful response. So I was fortunate. Um, and so that's how that, that spiraled. Um, you know, of course, I, I was not worried that I might lose my job. I was not worried that I was not the sole earner. You know, I didn't have those barriers that some people face and stop them from, from seeking their rights. Um, and I got the process going. So it was quite a, a lengthy process, but I, I guess I, I was, um, I, I had a good manager who was willing to take it forward and talk to unions and, and so forth and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, so that's how my experience panned out. But, and, and am I correct in thinking that the, really the only difference between uh, the, the job that had the salary that was high enough that it was on a management scale and yours was that you were serving the Pacific community and some of your colleagues were kind of um, didn't have, have a, a particular community that was serving or they were serving, you know, a Pākehā community. Um, and it, it, was, it was quite a considerable amount of money, wasn't it? And it's kind it of it's so telling that yeah. even in what seems to be an organization that was you know, trying to serve the community, and as you say, you were in a position of relative privilege, it still took months. And yeah. as you say, that's just not possible. For, so, so for me, the, the, the interesting things, well, the, the remarkable things about those, that story is just how big that gap was, and then how long it took you to actually get it re remedied with, with a helpful boss. Yeah, it, it, it was a significant gap. Um, um, you know, I was a, a solo parent at the time. So you can imagine what 30, 40 grand, you know, difference in pay. Yeah. Well, um, really, really significant. And being a Pacific person, you know, I also support my siblings back home, as I see most of my siblings back home. So, you know, the, the impact on the quality of life and being able to sleep and not worry, you know, being able to turn the heater on. You know, just the simple things that we hear today from our families are still struggling, you know, um, 
I'm, I'm talking about lived experience and the impact and what was so important. And so the, the campaign for pay transparency and Pacific inquiry is, is rooted in, in, in lived experience. Um, the, the majority of the team uh, who worked on the Pacific inquiry are Pacific themselves and our non-Pacific brothers and sisters also support us. Um, but it, none of us have come from a life of privilege. So we, we understand and, um, mm -hmm. and it helped that heart really helped fuel the, the inquiry. You know, it, it doesn't have a lot of money behind it um, compared to other inquiries, but so much heart and so much uh, personal investment uh, from people involved in seeing that inquiry, you know, come through. And um, we're now in the process of going back to our communities and reporting back in terms of, this is what we think you said, and these are the recommendations, and this is where we're taking the recommendations, yeah. just so they know. Absolutely. And I mean, uh, the inquiry engaged with about 1,200 Pacific workers, mm -hmm. didn't it? Um, so that's 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 a large amount. What are some of the stories that really stuck with you that, that you heard? I mean, it was, you know, we would hear people who've been, who have worked for the same company for years, sometimes decades, but have um, never had a pay rise. The only time perhaps when it increased was when the law changed and the minimum wage increased. You know, and yet they've been loyal. That's 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 their family, um, and so of course they've been trying to make ends meet, for, and it just becomes a normal thing that you struggle and make ends meet, however you want to do that. Um, and I think now, you know, with uh, companies crying out for talent, crying out for loyalty, um, maybe they should just look within <laughs> the organisations and recognise the people who have been there for you for so long. You know, that's that's one thing they can do. We've heard from people who've been um, casuals, you know, contractors for the same company for years and years, always, you know, asking for a permanent permanent role so they can plan their lives, for goodness sake, um, and, and not getting it. And yet the company is still happy to keep them, you know, and be able to call them, you know, at the drop of a hat, expect them to drop their lives and, you know, come to work. Again, in this context, would you treat people the same? I hope not. Um, and so it's, there's lots of stories like that. Unfortunately, we're still hearing stories of racism, you know, still stories of people not being able to get interviews. Finally, they thought maybe it's my name, change my name and voila, you get shortlisted, you know. <laughs> so unfortunately, that's still very live. Um, and it's not an issue that's, that, that's only been experienced by Pacific peoples. We hear it from our ethnic minorities, our brothers and sisters, other communities. Um, so one of the key things um, that I was determined to do get it in the inquiry is while we focus on the Pacific workforce, um, we did expect that a number of those experiences would be similar to the experiences of others, of others who are not indigenous to, um, to, um, to Aotearoa, as well as um, commonalities in terms of, uh, in terms of racism, in terms of sexism, you know, it, it, I mean, that's, you, those things are universal. So a lot of this, uh, a lot of the learning is really relevant. And as a result, the six key recommendations for government actually are, are there to benefit everybody. So for example, we ask the government, um, we, we add our voice to this call for making the living wage the minimum wage. If that happens, that will benefit all of our society. If, if I look at the numbers and we did some numbers, um, in terms of real numbers, in terms of European women, about 145,000 earned below the living wage. So if the government signs off on that, that's a whole lot of, <laughs> of, of, our, of our park assistance lifted up. Um, if we look at our, um, our, Asian, um, our Asian sisters, you know, 46,000 and so forth and so forth. So each one of these, these recommendations um, has come off from the inquiry, but actually it will lift all of us up. So it's really important. If we look at pay transparency, that's not just for Pacific, that's for everybody. It'll lift women up, our disabled uh, workers, you know, so forth. We're also calling for the government to ratify International Labour Organization um, Convention 190 on violence and uh, harassment. Again, not just Pacific people, we, will all, we all want to be safe in our workplaces. We all want that crap to stop. You know, we, we, want, we want to, we, we want our basic rights to be safe and free from discrimination at work, you know, to be to be true and realized. So, so that's what I mean. We we started off with Pacific, but 
the learning we hope will benefit all of us. It is about the human rights of all of us in our community, that fair society that, um, that I keep talking about. On, on behalf of us all, thank you so much. I think that shows, you know, a huge generosity given while you say um, these uh, these issues are felt by a number of communities, they are experienced often more more deeply um, by, by Pacific communities. Um, but I mean, that, that sounds like a fantastic principle to have your recommendations based on. And um, if we can um, pick a few of those recommendations, um, pick them up a little bit and, and detail them. Um, uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, enabling survivors of violence and harassment at work to more easily access support, um, can you, how widespread is the issue of violence and harassment at work, and is it um, experienced differently by different genders? Yeah, no, no, absolutely is. I have, I have the report, and I can send the report later, perhaps to share it with the network. Um, it's called Experiences of Workplace Bullying and Harassment in Aotearoa. Um, I mean, basically, the the overall prevalence of bullying, and we're talking about experience in the last 12 months, is around 20%. Um, so generally, yeah. in terms of racial harassment, it's 39% over the last five years. Um, the sexual harassment is 30% over the last five years. So they're quite significant. But when you look beneath the data, um, by ethnicity, Pacific peoples experience more of those behaviors than anyone else by, if you look at it by ethnicity. Um, certainly in terms of um, vulnerability, if you look at our disabled workers, the rates for disabled workers is astronomical in terms yeah. of experiencing those. So if you're Pacific with a disability, possibly female, you know, you, you have all those factors uh, that, that leads to, to, to high vulnerability. Um, so it's quite a, it's a shameful picture, Janet, um, for our workplaces. Um, and what, I mean, the, the hope that I saw in the figures was that um, the, the number of bystanders, so people who witness or who are aware of this going on, it's actually quite significant. So for me, you know, how do we enable or encourage or support bystanders uh, to stand up uh, in, in defense of, of people who have been victimized. Um, I heard the other day um, in a workplace where they won't accept complaints from a bystander if they're not the direct victim. Now, that's a real problem. <laughs> and if the person being you know, disempowered doesn't have the ability to, to, you know, to, to speak up for themselves and someone is standing up and yet they're, they're ignored, that, that's a problem. So. You know, we, we really have to, to look, look at our policies inside our organizations in terms of, you know, are they still, are they safe? Are they useful? Um, and so that's one thing. Um, and the other thing is, um, do our workers trust us? You know, so do our policies work? And, you know, if people wonder why, why people don't make complaints, well, maybe they don't trust it, they'll be taken seriously. And one of the things that we, that's the top recommendation in the research in terms of what people want is they want an independent person, independent eye, really, to come and investigate complaints of bullying and harassment. Um, I mean, so many of our businesses are small businesses, right? The, the distance between the, <laughs> there, isn't, there isn't a lot of uh, um, un, unbiased uh, sort of observation, if I can put it that way. So that's a real, that's a real problem. And um, so, but certainly vulnerability by ethnicity, um, Pacific ranked very highly, our uh, disabled, um, you know, uh, workforce, the rates are disgusting for a country that considers itself a pretty good, you know, nation. Um, and certainly some industries, we took a, um, uh, we, we oversampled for young people, especially in the hospitality um, and some of the, some of the stories that our young people told us are disgusting. Really. You know, um, uh, one, one young person we talked about, um, you know, she noticed depending on what she wore or whether she wore makeup on, like, so she'll get the, you know, the size of her tips, the tips it gets from customers will, will vary. She just got tired of feeling like a commodity and left. Um, and you know, someone, uh, another young person talked about how she was made to clean, clean up the, um, 
how do I say this? I don't mean disrespectfully. Um, clean up the piss. There was a pissing competition at the bar. Um, and uh, when people dispersed, um, the boss told her she had to clean that up. And she refused to clean it up. And said, well, that's your job. You know, so it's, you know, that was really degrading treatment um, of, of our young people. And uh, was, a, was a young woman in this case. I mean, it's, it should not be happening. So um, yeah, that we've got a big problem in terms of ensuring dignity and protecting dignity in our workplace. And I hope, I hope that with the current um, shortfall in work that people will treat our, our workers with more respect. And, um, but yeah, we've got a long way to go, Janet. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it does come back, I'm thinking, to to power and hierarchy. Yeah. Um, Laurie in the chat has just um, pointed out that we could perhaps be talking about um, people being targeted for greater degrees of violence rather than being vulnerable. I, it's not something that um, yeah. different groups have that's intrinsic. It's something that's yeah. pushed on us. Um, yes. And um, that, that goes with, you know, um, you know, the, having less power means the likelihood that people are asked to do something that's degrading or are bullied, um, uh, uh, you know, increases um, astronomically, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I think the the other one of the other interesting um, findings from the inquiry was this difference between visible explanations and invisible explanations in terms of um, the gap being mostly about discrimination and bias and other things which I guess are less easy to measure than the visible things like qualifications and experience. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you talk a little bit about this? I wonder if that's also linked to power and control as well. Yeah, yeah, um, and um, you'll be all relieved to know we had an economist look at this, so I didn't do it. So, <laughs> so it, yeah, it's a credible source. It uh, was done by um, Dr. Gail Pacheco and her team at the Work uh, Research Institute at AUT. Um, yeah, so they looked at occupation, uh, industry, um, education, um, to, to account for those factors that normally we would think, oh, maybe those that's the reason why. Um, but so they looked at those factors and they compared the difference in pay gaps between um, Pakistan men and uh, Pacific men, and only 27% of the pay difference could be explained by those factors. Uh, certainly when they compared our Pakistan sisters and our Pacific sisters, only 39% could be explained uh, by, by those observable factors, I suppose. So the rest of it was, I suppose, the environment, hey? the environment. And when we talk about the environment, it's when people talk about being overlooked despite experience, despite qualifications, despite loyalty, somehow our Pacific person is still not being good enough to get that promotion. Um, and, you know, when you apply year after year um, and you keep getting turned down, you, some of them begin to think maybe they're just not good enough, which is terrible. Yeah. It's that internalized it's, thing, isn't it? Yeah, they've, yeah. they've internalized the disempowerment. Um, and so it's, um, and then people complain that they're not putting their hand up. It's like, well, they, they've tried that and been knocked back so many times. That um, they've in terms, so it's um, yeah. So a lot of it is unexplained, um, and this um, gained a lot of media um, in terms of that. You know, we expected our workplaces to be um, to be fair, fair place, fair environments for work, but um, it's too much is unexplained, um, and we so, and it, it's easy to blame, say, the lack of education, or you know, because because then it can sort of shift the blame onto the onto the the victim of the discrimination. And, um, and that's a dangerous thing to do. And we can't continue to do that. We have to acknowledge, as I've just said, bullying and harassment in the workplace, it's a huge problem. So. Yeah, so so look, we're, I, I know there'll be people who are wondering when we're getting to pay transparency, we'll get there in a moment. Um, but I just um, want to go back to this idea of bystanders that you raised. Are these bystanders who are just around and may or may not be doing something, or are these people who who are trying to do something? And and you know what what would you obviously as you've mentioned, there's um, policy that can happen at the level of organisation to um, to at least not discourage people from um, trying to empower their colleagues. But um, what would you say to 
people who who are concerned or want to know how, you know what they need to be looking out for and what to do about it yeah. presumably you'd want to empower the person who was at the the center of it rather than you know try to be the savior yeah yeah a absolutely um and as i said if i think about what happened to me i didn't need anyone to stand up for me i'm educated you know i have a home i'm not hungry my kids are safe you know with all that assured I can stand up, I can afford emotionally and financially to stand up for myself. We're talking about majority of people who can't afford lawyers, you know. So so it's um so on one hand, you know, you don't want to rescue people. On the other hand, we have a responsibility to ensure that our workplaces are safe. And uh, people are simply acting on their duty to keep each other safe. I mean, you know, our workplaces, you know, we're friends, you know, that sort of thing. So you can't turn a blind eye when you see your friend or your colleague hurting and if something is deeply wrong. So I think we need to look at our policies in terms of uh, what, what is there. Um, do we have training for bystanders or training for everybody? If you, if you witness it, you know, if something feels wrong, it probably is wrong. You know, our, our instincts, especially our instincts of women, this is pretty, it's, it's always pretty spot on. Um, so I think we, we need to, ensure that we have adequate training in our workplaces to make sure that, that people know what to do and what they can do. Um, and also, you know, our, our, our leaders, you know, our senior managers, our boards, our directors, you know, they also need training in it because if our leaders aren't on board with equity and equality and everything else, then it makes it really hard uh, for for change to, to happen, so that's really important. Um, but certainly another thing that um, that came out of the research was, um, you know, a very a very small number of people who've experienced uh, experienced this form of, of violence, um, you know, actually make formal complaints. I think only about one percent would go to MB. Their stand would come to the Human Rights Commission. You know. Um, those who do speak about it would speak to a colleague that they trust, or of course we speak to Fano and, and friends, but there's not much that they can do when it's, when it's happening there. So one of the things that I raised uh, with some of our large organizations um, who often have networks like Maori staff or Pacific networks, um, you know, rainbow networks, you know, look at empowering those networks because clearly they're a place of refuge uh, for victims. Um, is there a role that those networks can have in terms of, you know, um, stepping up and providing some support for the person who's been affected, you know, to take matters, you know, to take matters forward. Um, but in terms of do people trust current mechanisms, do they trust current provisions through MB, through the Human Rights Commission? Um, I would say no. And, and, and they might be right. I mean, at least in terms of MB, I'm not going to speak about the HSC, but. It's costly emotionally, financially. It's, it's costly and it's scary, mm. and it hurts. So we have to do better. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about pay transparency. When we're talking about pay transparency, um, what what do we mean exactly? Yeah. So, in quite simple terms, uh, we're talking about, for example, when you put an ad out to make sure that the remuneration for the job is in the ad. Um, and uh, as, as you go up to more senior levels, we're not just talking about pay, we're talking about other benefits, uh, you know, like uh, bonuses, shares, cars, all of those things matter because the pay can show you this little bit, but it doesn't show you the whole package. And, and we know that the, the higher up you go. So for example, so that's an example of pay transparency. We also want uh, to stop the practice of asking applicants about their current salary, because we know that if, you know, if, if they say the salary is lower than what you thought, they think, oh, great, we've got a bargain. So we, we want to stop questions like that. We also want um, to remove uh, the ability to for employers to have in their contracts this clause that forbids people from talking about pay. Um, my daughter has one of those. But she was too scared to ask the boss if they can take it off. But I mean, it was her, it was her first job. But you know, it's, it's kind of like we want to empower empower our workers. Uh, but by putting in these clauses, you shut them down. 
in, in a Dennis magazine, so Dennis is from one of the unions, he said, uh, so among some of, some, some of our migrant workers, even when they find out that they've been paid unfairly, in their minds are not supposed to know. And so it's, you know, it, it prevents justice from happening. It, it, it prevents remedies from happening. So simple clauses like that. And we do want a, um, a public reporting of uh, pay gaps um, by, by our companies, um, which means that you need to start measuring things like ethnicity characteristics, like ethnicity and disability. Because if you don't have the data, then number one, it's hard to prove to anyone that you're paying it, that you know that you're paying everybody fair, even though you might believe in your heart that you are doing the right thing. Without the data, it's it's hard. But also, when you have the data, then you know you have to do different. Um, so yeah, those are that's what I mean by pay transparent. It's a collection of actions that we need to do uh, to really empower our workers. Um, I mean. Right now, we want to we want to attract workers. We want to invest in our workers. We want them to stay. Um, and I think equity can be a selling point. You know, reputation really matters now, and leadership matters. Yeah. So perhaps we can use you know, as you were talking about the employment market, not only to make things okay for some individual workers at the moment, but also to perhaps use it as leverage to to change things on a mass scale. Um, on that point, um, in terms of pay transparency and organisations being public about their gaps, is that something that we can legislate for, do you think? Janet, I, I think we have to. I think we have to, to, to legislate for it. I mean, you know, we're, we're looking at modern slavery legislation right now, because in the end, we've, we've decided that we simply can't, can't not legislate. <laughs> um, so I, I think for pay transparency, it's such a fundamental thing. We're, we're simply talking about equality. You wouldn't think it was a lot to ask for, but clearly it, 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 it's a big thing, right? You're, you're smiling. <laughs> oh, I look, I'm just like, we're, we're asking people to give up power, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. And going, well, how, how do we do that? Are we asking, are we demanding? But, you know, we can go into to tactics another time perhaps. Yeah. Are you able um, to talk about what happened at the um, Human Rights Commission in terms of, um, it looked at its own pay gaps, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, we did. Um, so we, we looked at, our, we, we looked at a cost in terms of ethnicity. We also looked at disability. Um, so, you know, we're on a journey just like everybody else. We, we discovered our pay gaps um, and then we looked at how, why those gaps exist. Um, so for example, um, though some, some, you know, some of our colleagues um, were often taught, well, let's, let's, let's talk about um, the, the use of te reo. You know, often we would call on them um, to, to exercise their, their cultural skills as, you know, as, as part, of our, part of our daily business, but we've never compensated for it, we never remunerated it. So, so, so adjustments have been made accordingly so that that is captured because that's that's a crucial skill, it's, it's a crucial um, capital for the Human Rights Commission. So, you know, just uh, that's, those are the sort of things that we did. Um, and uh, where, where inequities were discovered by the team, um, pay was adjusted accordingly. So, um, yeah, but like I said, you know, we had to have our own um, journey. Um, certainly as part of the trade pay, pay transparency campaign, uh, I, I insisted that any ads that go out for jobs, the, the Human Rights Commission have the have the salary visible, if not in the ad, in the attached job description. So it, it's there, yeah, there's no mystery to it. So, you know, that's that's been our journey and, you know, we, we continue to, to make sure we hold ourselves to account. Yeah, I, I wonder, I mean, I thought it was such a fantastic thing that the Human Rights Commission was leading by example on this, partially because I wonder how many employers are perhaps put off by this idea that by looking at their pay gaps, they will have to acknowledge that, you know, they're systematically racist, sexist, discriminatory in other ways. Mm -hmm. And of course, by highlighting that, you know, it's, it's necessary, but it, it, it can feel to people like, that they're getting flack for something that someone else down the road is worse at, you know, um, but not not seeing it yet. But you're, I mean, the Human Rights Commission is like we we are we're on this journey as well. Do you think that's helpful? Yeah, we're we're, we're on this journey, and and sometimes you know some in some organisations decisions that were made by by leaders ten years ago, 
even longer that are still there, like, are they still relevant to our time now? It, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to, 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 to make change. Um, and certainly, you know, in our current context where we want to hold on to people, you know, I, I really encourage everyone to, to look at your HR processes, you know, and, and the way that you that you promoted people going forward. Are, are you missing a, perhaps a, a, another view? Uh, one of the things we have in uh, the Human Rights Commission, um, if you want to put yourself forward, there's a period where you can put yourself forward for progression. And so there's a whole process around progression. It's not a decision of the supervisor or the manager. There's a panel that reviews it. So, the, so you get different eyes and different views on on you know on on the merits of the application and so forth. So we are really working really hard at it. Um, certainly, one of the things that that I recommended to our team is if you're going to look at cultural competence, make sure you've got the appropriate <laughs> person on the panel with the competence that you're looking at assessing. Um, so yeah, we're learning as we go, but um, it, I always say to just just get started. You know, um, the gap, no matter how how scary it might seem to you, um, just just get started, and then you know, get your data, and then and move forward from there. Um, but yeah, just because it's always been like that doesn't doesn't mean it needs to continue like that. Are there privacy issues, particularly for workers in smaller organizations, if they're part of a minority group and they might be only one and, and therefore, you know, it will be their pay um, that's that's publicized? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's 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 often the, the question of for, for SMEs, you know, will we be breaching privacy? And so we've got to balance this, um, the, the right to privacy to also being the right to be free from discrimination. Mm, and the mm. right to equity and the right to equal employment. So, you know, we, we need to balance those rights, uh, but we can't sacrifice all for the sake of one. Right. And as I said, we're in a small village, people talk anyway. <laughs> it, it, it's, bound to, it's bound to come out at, at some conversation. Um, it's, it's just the way it is. So, so that's my response to that, Janet. It's a tricky one, but as I said, are we gonna give up equality and equity of this and who does it serve and look maybe it's up to the rest of us if you know to, to to get used to the idea that our pay will also be public knowledge even if even if it we can hide in a, in a group and statistics we can potentially um express solidarity by letting people know how much we're paid for what we're doing um as, as a you know as a as an action um while you were talking about that the idea of cultural competency i mean obviously that unfortunately happens in a large number of organizations. I suspect that people have Maturanga Māori or they have cultural competency and that's not acknowledged but is drawn on. And I'm thinking it might be useful for, you know, to have a union of, of people who, who have um, cultural competency so that, um, uh, you, you know, because uh, to have that kind of collective um, a protection um, to go, this is how my organization's um, acknowledging my cultural competency or ensuring that there is somebody whose role it is to do this thing that I was normally drawn on. Um, so unions, um, somebody's got a message, uh, 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 um, uh, a question in the chat, Sina. She says, Talofa, Sanoa. Hello, hello, Sina. <laughs> um, thank you for your leadership and tautua. Where do various workers' unions sit on the issue of pay discrimination and the ethnic Pacific pay gap? Are they doing anything to address it in companies, organisations? And I know unions themselves are asking, what can they do? So I guess there's a double double thing there. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're really encouraged that the unions um, have, have come on board more visibly. Um, I'm sure it's been there because I'm sure their Pacific workers over the years have been asking for support. Um, so certainly we took the recommendations to CTU and they welcomed the recommendations. Um, one of the things, for example, that we asked uh, the unions to do in terms of their um, pay negotiations, that they include clauses in there about closing the ethnic pay gap, that that becomes part of the agreement, you know, for with, um, with an employer or, or, or the collective, that there's intention to measuring the ethnic pay gap and closing the ethnic pay gap. Because um, when we when we talk about ethnicity, um, then then we acknowledge that Pacific and Maori men um, and our Asian men uh, um, also suffer 
from the pay gap. Um, so it's um, it's really important. So that's one of the recommendations that we made to the union, that when you bargain, make sure you include clauses around closing um, gender and ethnic pay gaps. So, um, and that will ultimately mean that the, business, the businesses uh, that sign up to those contracts um, know that they're expected to address pay equity based on ethnicity. So that's that's one of the um, the recommendations that we've made to the unions. I was going to ask who who watches the the pay gaps, or you know, and does the do the unions perhaps have a role to make sure that reporting is is clear and and present, as it were? But I know that obviously one of the recommendations is that there is an independent body whose whose yeah. job it is to monitor. Yeah, I mean, unions certainly have a role, um, but the majority of well, the majority of Pacific workers don't belong to unions. So that's why we need the whole systemic, that's why we need the legislation that it covers everyone. You know, it, it provides and, and pursues equity for everybody. Um, the, I mean, not just specific, but the general population, you know, the numbers that belong to unions is smaller than the ones who don't. Um, so it's really important. Uh, we, we, want, uh, we, we wanted a, a, an independent uh, body to look at it um, so that they're, they're not torn in loyalties between, you know, the unions or the businesses or to government, because, you know, government, the public service also have their own journey on pay equity. Um, so that, that's why we wanted the, uh, an independent uh, body. I mean, in Australia, they have an independent body. Um, uh, they don't yet look at ethnicity, as far as I know. Uh, so they, they're, they're very interested in the work that we're doing. So, um, yeah. I'm glad they're interested at least. And it's interesting that they've got the independent body. So perhaps we can learn from each other. Yeah. yeah. Um, now might be a good time to um, let people know that we would love you to fill out our feedback survey for tonight. Um, it really helps us um, know how best to run these sessions and also um, helps us um, ensure that we can keep going um, with funding for them. So I think um, that link will hopefully be put in the chat soon if it hasn't already. Um, but you mentioned uh, governments on its own journey, Karanina, um, and Leone has asked in the chat, um, have you had the opportunity to talk to relevant cabinet ministers about your recommendations yet? And if so, um, what kind of response? Are you hopeful about what they're, they're thinking? Yeah, yeah. Um, we, you know, I, I mean, um, I'm assuming everybody knows that you know, the um, public service have had this uh, workforce that's been working on, you know, the gender pay gap, and now they're working on the ethnic pay gap. It oh. seems to take so long, though, Karanina. No, you know, it's like, sure, we know, we know what to do. <laughs> yep, and, and 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 there is improvement. Like the the recently released report, you know, there's definitely improvement. But certainly, when it comes to Pacific, the gap is still so so huge. You know, there's a, there's a long way to go. But um, and they, you know, so they 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 certainly made a lot of progress. Um, but in terms of government, uh, we've had conversations with Minister Tuniti. Of course, um, and uh, Minister Woods and Minister Alpito. And we've also approached and I've met with a member of the National Party and a member of the Act Party. Um, so I'm, I've been lobbying anyone who would give me the time <laughs> to listen. Um, and I was really excited. Uh, Minister Tineti hosted the launch of the inquiry report in Parliament. Um, and a few days later, she, she made that announcement about. Uh, the Pay Transparency Working Group. Uh, NACU is, um, is the center of that group and it's, they've invited the uh, Human Rights Commission to be part of the, of the deliberation. So, and I'm glad that they're doing it together, that the Ministry for Women is doing it together with MD. Because it's, you know, this is about all of our workers, um, not, not just us, not just us women, our sisters, it's about lifting everybody up. So, so that's a positive sign. It's, um, it's certainly, uh, we're hoping that perhaps one of the things I, I asked to the minister, if you can't commit right now, can you commit in your manifesto? I wasn't letting them off the hook. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm hoping that maybe when the parties put out their manifesto, there'll be something there about pay transparency. Um, and, and all the manifestos, we, we, all we the hope. Yeah. yeah. So, um, As you'd say, it's a tight employment market. It's it's a useful thing to be to be pushing for now, I think. Yeah. Um, this is the time, yeah. 
you're aiming to eliminate the pay gap in 20 years by 2042. Um, why 20 years and, and is there kind of like a, what might used to be called a roadmap, but what we could call, I don't know, a rowing map or something more um, climate change friendly? Yes, it, you know, so it's a, so largely the role of the Human Rights Commission is to influence, you know, to promote awareness. So we're not the ones who provide the jobs or who provide the help, you know, we, we don't have that, that sort of role. Our role is to um, support social movements, lift awareness, and through that, get change. Um, in so 20 uh, years, 20 in, years though. I tell you why. So um, prior to my time, the Human Rights Commission did some calculations and they said, if, if we don't close the pay gap now, at the rate that we're progressing the pay gap for Pacific, it's gonna take 120 years. I, it's glacial. But Progress the, is a, yeah. a mirage. Yes. So, so, so when people say, why 20 years? Well, they want to like tomorrow. Well, of course, we'd like it tomorrow. But, you know, looking at the reality of it, also, you know, look at our gender pay gap, eh? you know, 50 years of the Equal Pay Act, we're still not there yet. So, um, but I am really, um, maybe I am naive, and sometimes I choose to be, but I'm really optimistic that, um, that our young people will, will not tolerate this. Um, you know, they expect they expect the better world that we raise them to, you know, to, to have. Um, and this is the time, you know, we've got aging populations globally, including in New Zealand. You know, we want to hold on to our people. We don't want to lose them. And, you know, the, the, the high, high fertility rates are amongst Maori and Pacific. Our natural um, population growth is coming from these populations. So I really want our businesses to think longer and to really, you know, really address what's going on in their workplaces that make it unsafe, that make it um, uneconomical for modern Pacific to be in their workplaces and take their talent out to them. So we, we have an opportunity right now to do different um, and pay transparency will benefit everybody. You know, if you're transparent, I believe that they'll become part of, equity will become part of your reputation, part of your brand, and you will draw talent to you. So, you know, we can see things in a positive light. Um, and um, yeah. Yeah, abs absolutely. And I mean, coming back to that principle of what's good for Pacific workers is good for everyone. I mean, this is this is the great thing about looking after people who are the most targeted is that it helps everybody as opposed to the people who have got the most power. It's, you know, everybody else is an add on and, and you know, it keeps, keeps you know, uh, generating those abuses. Yeah. Um, can we turn to seasonal migrant worker exploitation, if that's okay? Um, you've helped to uncover horrific migrant worker exploitation this year um, that some have even called modern slavery. Um, and just to, to paint the picture for, for people who may not be um, aware, I'd just like to, um, if that's okay, quote you on Twitter, where you were like, um, it was negative two degrees the morning that you visited um, the seasonal workers, but the bedrooms felt much colder, like, I, and I'm speaking in your voice now, was, was in a cooler. One room had a red bucket to catch the leak from the roof, clothes stuffed inside the hot cylinder cupboards to dry and got warm the next shift, even if they were still damp. And this is, you know, in, in the kind of sub-zero temperatures. They weren't allowed to gather even on their day off and drink cover, their traditional drink. These were grown men with no privacy for months on end, not allowed per visitors without permission, debt ridden despite working even when sick, on company direction. They were living in houses not considered acceptable for ordinary Kiwi. I felt their loss of hope. They had been sold false assurances by New Zealand employers and let down by officials along the way. You continued talking about the violations of human rights of the seasonal workers saying there is inequitable access to justice and exploitation. We must fix this immediately. That was in August. Is the government now doing enough to stop these shameful practices? I don't have assurance that that's the case, Janet. Um, certainly the, the public outcry when, when that story broke um, was, was significant. And then within a short time, um, the government allowed an extra 3,000 workers from the Pacific to come. Um, I would have thought we, we want to make sure that we had built the additional accommodation at least, you know, <laughs> I mean, where, where would they go? You know, we, we have a tight market, a housing market already, you know. I talked about, you know, men, you know, 
sleeping in bunks, um, grown men for months, you know, in the same room. So if you're going to bring another 3,000 people, where, where are you going to put them? Um, you know, that simple, simple things like that. We still hadn't addressed um, the mystery deductions that happens to people's uh, pay that, that happen. Uh, we haven't addressed the issue that some of the RSC workers would arrive in New Zealand and then suddenly find that the terms of their contracts had been changed and the contracts are all in English anyway. So it's, it's kind of like, I haven't been, you know, reassured that those things I have stopped or have been addressed. Um, I'm not sure that the, the workers who have the courage to speak to me have received any compensation you know, as a result of what happened to them. None of that has happened. Um, we notified police of our concerns um, of, uh, of actions that would constitute a common assault, at least. We're still waiting on the outcome of those. And those operators are still operating. So, why do you think? Why, why has there been, why is it so stubborn? Um, I, you know, we, we, of course, we want to, we want our businesses to succeed, right? Because if our business succeed, it's good for New Zealand, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't want to be known as a nation that benefits off slavery. And we, we don't want to be a nation that benefits yeah. off slavery. Yeah. We, we don't want to be known, you know, as 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 that. And um, we often talk about Pacific nations being our family, our cousins, our Fanola. That's not how you treat Fanola. So a lot of us feel horrified but helpless about this. What what key things can we do as citizens, as as people in social justice organisations? What what can? Yeah. What what what? <laughs> yeah, I mean. I mean you know, the, the easy thing to say is often say, oh, you know, just don't buy the products. But if you if you don't know that, it's, it's not like there's a registry of bad ones that you know they're not to buy their products. Um, it, 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 that's kind of like a, a privileged response to it. So I think if you if you if you're working, um, you know, if you're working in those particular sectors where they have RC, please, you know, if you see something wrong, please um, raise it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm meeting. I'm, I'm, I'm in, um, I'm in discussions with the, the wineries, um, their, their national organisations on sorted culture. You know, they're, they're doing their best. I'm encouraging them. You know, you must know who's working in your particular network. Um, we seem to have lost Karanina. Um, hopefully, she comes back and unfreezes really, really soon. But um, while we wait for that, um, kia ora everyone, thank you so much for your messages and your questions. Um, if anybody else has any more, let us know, or perhaps now's a good time to, um, to uh, fill out your, your um, feedback form um, and let us know how you've, you've enjoyed tonight. Um, Eleanor or, or Leone, if you want to jump in, that, that's that's good. Otherwise, um, we'll just um, wait for a couple of moments and see if Karanina comes back. I could just, um, Janet, I could just tell people a little bit um, that I'm aware of regarding uh, regarding um, my, uh, pay transparency. What um, Karanina was saying about um, Jantanitis uh, getting NICU involved and, um, you know, they're, they're planning to write a report. Well, actually, that's exactly what was decided about five years ago. <laughs> exactly the same thing was decided five years ago um, uh, under the leadership. What was, what was the Green Party woman who was uh, Ministry for Women's name's Escapes uh, Mary, uh, Julianne Genta. Yes, Julianne Genta set up exactly that five years ago. So it's not a not huge process to have that set up again um, recently. Yeah, it's, it's, it's disappointing. It's it's time to stop setting up committees and writing reports and researchers um, and doing research. It's it's time to actually pass. A pay transparency legislation. Mm -hmm. 
Kia ora, thanks Leone. That's Leone, the uh, co-manager for Te Wahi Wahene or Tamaki Makoto, um, the Auckland Women's Centre, um, talking about pay transparency there. How are we going with any sign of Karenina? Ah, she's, mo she's moving, I think. Oh, she froze again. <laughs> Kia ora, Karenina, can you hear us? I think she's still on mute. Oh, and she may have disappeared. Oh, there she is, yay. I think you've come back, Karanina, um, so we can see you typing. Her um, microphone is on mute. Ah, there we are. Sorry. The, the thing went off, the computer. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry about that, team. Yeah, we talked about what you could do. Um, you know, aside from, um, from from keeping an eye on on the products on our on our um, on on the in the, in the shopping um, shelves, and if you're part of those networks, please raise your voice. Um, when we broke the story, we had um, Kiwis from all around the country, just in local communities, who had heard rumors about um, you know people being charged two hundred dollars a week, you know, to, to to share the room, like. It, it appears to be common knowledge in some of those, those communities. Um, and we're talking about rural communities often where people, you know, the word gets around pretty quickly. Um, you know, so if, if, if you're in those communities, you know, you're, you're in a position where you have nothing to lose if you make contact with the relative, with the with respective company and, and let them know that, that you've seen something, you know, that, that's worrying you about how certain workers have been treated. Um, and if you feel, you know, call the Human Rights Commission, call the police, depending on, on what, what the issue is. But um, don't stay quiet because I can tell you, specific workers who are desperate for em employment, um, what's at stake for them is huge. And the likelihood of them speaking out um, is, is not high when they've, when they've, you know, they've given everything to get here. Um, and actually, for some we spoke to, they wanted to go back home, you know, and um, they had to still work the hours just to earn that fare to go home. But they went with nothing. I mean, is, the, is that a potential thing we could do is to create a fund for, for seasonal workers? People have asked about that. Certainly there were offers, you know, can we create a fund? Can there be a give a little? Uh, you know, fun page, um, and certainly it's something that I, I it was a request that I passed on to unions, and there are a couple of unions that were supporting, um, so perhaps contact the unions, um, Amalgamated Union is one of them, First Union is another one, um, who is, you know, providing a voice for these workers, um, it, unfortunately it wasn't something that the Human Rights Commission could do, but certainly yeah. offers that I passed on uh, to the unions. <laughs> Um, and and when you're talking about being careful about you know what we're buying uh, and not buying the the proceeds of of this exploitation, um, you say there's no list. Yeah. But how, where do we find the information to perhaps create a list or, or you know how, how do we know? Yeah, and that's that's a difficult thing. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to mention the, the particular wineries I went to. Um, because you know, I'm hoping that things are being investigated and things will be made right. Um, but at some point, at some point, and depending on where we go in terms of our modern slavery legislation that we're that we're sort of discussing it in the, at some point there must be a register of the the bad the bad apples. So that's the only way that the public can see. At the moment, there is no there's, there's no such register. So. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah, I noticed look that someone in the chat said we shouldn't need a fund, we need justice for these workers. Absolutely, but you know, justice comes with a price tag sometimes, and perhaps that fund could be used to to um pay for lawyers, for example, or or um, yeah. other things like that. Yeah, I absolutely. I mean, one of the difficulties is um, of course, English isn't the first language for a lot of these workers. Um, so investigations that are conducted in English only go so far, and, and I did make this point to um, to the ministers, you know, if we're going to send in our inspectorates and conduct these things in English, well, you know, I mean, the only way I was able to get there 
um, to give the information is because one of my advisors spoke with the, the mother tongue of, of the workers. So we were able then to understand that the depth and the, the duration of the exploitation and the historical nature of it. So, um, and so, but when they leave the country, then <laughs> it makes it even harder because they're out of mind, out of sight, um, and trying to track people down, especially in rural sectors, you know, where internet's not necessarily a thing. I mean, it gets so much easier to continue to exploit um, when they're out of the country. So, you know, there's so much that we need to do. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see um, a, a link between the seasonal worker exploitation and the Pacific Pay Gap? Um, we, we didn't look specifically at the, at the seasonal workers because it's a, it's, it's a different arrangement, but certainly, you know, we, we had workers who have become, I met someone who's been coming off the last seven years now to the, you know, to the same employer, to the same type of work. So in an, an ordinary Kiwi, you'd had seven years of experience, you know, you'd expect their wage to be at a certain level. But they come and start at the same level. They might get maybe a couple of dollars more than the, the beginners, but that's it. So it's almost like our standards for what's decent work is for a Kiwi um, is not applied to RSE workers. Mm. And yet they're humans. You know, we have the same human rights regardless of your visa status. Um, so RSE workers pay taxes, but they don't have access to our public health system. Now, why how is how is that fair? But we need them to be healthy because we brought them here to be productive. You know, you can't have everything in exchange for peanuts. It, it, it's, it's inhumane, it's, 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 it's not decent. In your opinion, does it feel like this is embedded in the industry? Can we have a horticulture industry without exploitation? Um, I, I believe we can, uh, Janet, because you know, there are good employers um, there are good uh, farm owners, um, but what I don't like is the silence about what's going on in the networks by others. Uh, like I said, you know, we're such, a, we're such a small village as a nation anyway, it's hard to hide anything. Um, so surely people must know what's going on. If you've got random people in the community emailing the commission telling us what they've heard and they've known about this exploitation, why wouldn't an industry group have known about that and have acted? So I've asked our industry groups, please act, you know, and hold your networks to account. Um, because if that, if that can happen, then, you know, that that's the ideal, because you don't want, you know, government storming in all the time. But at this point in time, I, I don't think that businesses are able to act by themselves. They, they do need support of legislation. Um, government can't say, well, you know, that's that's business, that's private. That's, no, we can't do that. We're talking about humans here, and we're talking about um, the labor supply upon which, you know, our exports rely on, you know, and mm -hmm. our exports rely on. So, yeah, human mm -hmm. rights needs to be at the core of those labor migration things and, and, um, and um, in relevant employment laws. And we have to remember that regardless of visa status, human rights belongs to everybody. It's not only keys at human rights and people here for seven months don't. You know, that, that's not a decent society. You know, we, we need to do so much better. So I, I, you know, I'm looking forward to this review that the government has announced in the new year. They say they're going to do a review of it. Um, and um, I, I think some public trust has been lost when the, the exposure of the problems came out. And I think we need to earn that back. And certainly we're in, we're in competition with Australia for um, for skilled labor from the Pacific. So um, they can easily choose not to come and support our businesses and go elsewhere. Mm, mm, mm. Hilda, sorry, it looks like the chat's just popping off. Um, yeah, just uh, more, more, more stories there about health status and access to services when they're paying taxes. Um, someone in Samoa with, with a room of other women, not just, just men away from children and working hard, and that's in Australia. Um, so I think, I mean, when you're talking about those bystanders in the community, we, we've kind of come full circle again, haven't we? And we're talking about collectivity and we're talking about looking after each other and, and ensuring um, that, that, you know, human rights abuses aren't, uh, don't just get shoved under the, under the 
the carpet anymore. So um, kia ora Karanina, I think we will, we will leave it on that note. Thank you so, so much uh, for your time and sharing your wisdom and your knowledge and your scholarship with us. So, so thank you so much for that. Um, thank you so much to Tarin and to Stephanie for, um, for signing. Um, it's, it's much appreciated. Um, and um, thanks to everyone for coming and for participating and for your um, comments and your questions. Um, I've certainly learned a lot. So um, kia ora, and I will hand over to Catherine to just close us off with a karakia. Kia ora, Jenna. Kia ora, Karanina. Kua mutu a mato mahi. Motine wa manakatia mai mato katoa o mato hoa o mato o mato fano ayo ki te aurangi amini. Good night, everyone. Thank night. you. Thank you.